What's up YouTube? Coolest Bushcraft here. Uh, today I've got a pretty interesting video. Um, yesterday I actually went to the Minnesota Renaissance Festival and uh, I was looking for two types of people. Uh, I was looking for like a uh, ceramics expert and then a blacksmith and I found both of them. Um, and so basically these interviews that I had with them was just to kind of learn uh, a little bit more about the subject and uh, and just get some guidance on what I need to do next and um, it kind of changed my mindset uh, in in the way where I want to restructure my uh, channel um, and I'll talk more about my restructuring of the channel in a different video but uh, for today's video it's just gonna be the two interviews uh, and I hope you guys learned something because I certainly did um, and uh, look forward to the next video all right thanks all right and uh, so my name is Tom okay. um, my channel is clueless bushcraft and cool. it's about learning and discovery okay. and uh, I'd like for you to kind of just introduce yourself and what okay. you do here uh, well my name is Anthony mm -hmm. uh, Anthony Hunter I make pottery been making pottery for about 20 years plus. Uh, I started in high wow. school. Uh, I really, really liked it, and I, I started to surround myself with people that were better at it than I was. And uh, so, um, 20 years later, I'm doing it, and it's been my full-time job since since I was an adult. Yeah, that's that's, that's amazing. The you know the 101. If, it, if it's blowing up, you're going too fast. Yeah. So that's the clay that actually gets fired and okay. and does um, like cook. Mm -hmm. uh, this but is like, like uh, why why is it broken? Is it because the it, in yeah, firing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The moment like I start gradually putting it mm -hmm. in, like it just starts popping and just breaking and exploding. Okay. Yeah, and it's pretty aggressive too. And like this is the clay, and as far as I know. It, I mean, it, it's it's pretty pure for it's, the mo well. Not yeah, this, this looks really good. Yeah, actually. super smooth. Yeah, really elastic too. Mm -hmm. So I I've looked it Have up. You refined it or it just comes out like this? I, I found it like that. Yeah, I don't wow. refine it or anything. Wow. Yeah. So all I do is I just knead it. Mindy, check this out. Look how smooth this clay is. This is Texas clay dugout, unrefined. It's like super elastic and super smooth. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. That's it like, yeah. It looks like it came out of a factory. It really does. Like I have about fifty pounds of it, and for the most part, it's all, all the clay is like that. Okay. Oh my goodness, yeah. It's completely. It's it's almost like it's polymer clay. It feels oily. I know that's mm. my when I looked at it. That was my first thought. Is it looked like uh, it does? It looks cool, like... man. Yeah, good find. Um, yeah. So the blowing up part uh, yeah. when the pot the pots are I take it dry. Yeah. Okay, and they're... like for two weeks even. For two and weeks. Then okay. I even like try to dry it further. And they're and they're not thick. Yeah. They're, they're, the walls are that thick approximately, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and you're putting them around, I'm just taking, you're putting them around the fire for a while first. Yeah. And then you slowly move them closer to the fire. Yeah. And you're rotating them as you do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, and then you lay them in the hot coals or yeah. what? Okay, yeah. So right I on lay the them on the coals. Yeah. Um, should I not do that you know, or should I, I just I, push? I've, ne I've never pit fired. So, yeah. uh, I, the best advice I can give you is to point you in the direction of uh, if you dug this, are you from Texas? Do you live in Texas? No, I, I'm from Minnesota, but okay. I, I lived in Texas for a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I would try to find communities where you found this clay. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Native American communities that might have been using this for a long time. Yeah. And might have some actual learned experience from it. Okay. Um, Is, so I looked up a few things where like I heard there's something called grog or maybe even something mm -hmm. called... Um, like tempering the clay by adding sand or something. Yeah, grog that... is just like a it's fired clay that's been pulverized and then added to the, the soft unfired clay. Yeah, is, is that something I probably should do? No, I wouldn't worry. I would that wouldn't. No, I don't think that has anything to do with it. Okay. Um, 
I, it's just, I think you're shocking it, and it's just, how long, okay, so the pots are, this is like fired, an hour. yeah, mm-hmm. so they're in there, and they blow up after an hour being in there. So, no, like, the moment it gets, like, I, I, I guess the moment I place it on the hot coals, mm-hmm. that's when it starts exploding. Okay. Yeah, but for the most part, as I have it on the outside, for like an hour and rotating it, mm-hmm. it's fine, but like, the moment it comes into contact it's with like a thermal, hot yeah, coal it's or something. Shock. Yeah, it's thermal Yeah? Because it's, okay. it's hot on one side and it's not hot on the other side. Okay. So the reason that um, pots can withstand this heat that we're firing is that it's uniform heat within the kiln. Okay. And so when you're putting it on the fire, then it's not uniform. Okay. And so it just, it's it, you're just jumping from one temp to the next too fast. So the only thing I can think about or that I can think might help is putting a barrier between you don't, like I wouldn't put them on the coals Mm -hmm. but like put down a barrier and then put the pots on that and then cover the pots another with continue with that barrier and then maybe build a fire on top of that as well and so then that they're kind of like smoldered in there yeah and so it kind of dilutes the heat it's like you put something in a cool you have an ice pack in the cooler yeah um there's certain foods you want to keep cold but you don't want to freeze right Mm -hmm. so the ones you that wouldn't be a problem to freeze like let's say you put your piece of fish on the bottom and then you put your orange on top of that or your apple on top of that. Because you don't want your apple to freeze or your zucchini to freeze because it changes it and makes it gross, right? Okay, yeah. So it's like creating that barrier where it's still warm, mm-hmm. but it's not going to cause thermal shock. So I kind of want to so just make sure I like get it really, really even and it's like a uniform heat that's coming at it then? Yeah, like dilute the heat by putting a barrier i don't know what that barrier you're gonna have to experiment like just bricks and stuff maybe Um, because i essentially had it in like a brick sort of oven type thing you know it's sort of like just a pit fire type of thing and then so i have the fire around it and then and then i just kind of put it towards it gradually okay and then I've seen like videos mm-hmm. of people doing it, and they literally just put it in right the in fire. The yeah, right and in they, the coals, and, and then yeah, and they don't blow up. And then they and like di- put it's a different clay, different property. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, and I don't know what what kind of wood you're using. Like some mm-hmm. some woods produce hotter coals than others. Like a yeah. like a pine or a spruce isn't going to produce as hot of a coal as a hardwood like oak or a maple. Okay. So if you're using oak or maple, it may be a hotter coal. Where if you used uh-huh. maybe something less, or if I, my thought is, whatever wood you're using, the, the coals are too hot. So put down something like maybe some hay or a barrier of yeah. wood, and then kind of dampen the fire, kill the fire by smothering it with combustibles, but so, with limited airflow between them, so that mm-hmm. you don't. Because the more oxygen, of course, the quicker the fire is going to take off. So if you limit the oxygen and cover it with hay or something like that and then cover it with some more sticks and then that will slowly burn this is just yeah hypothetical just, i'm just like just trying to work through yeah. this just putting that clay in a i don't know just put it in your regular oven and getting it you know up to fight you know hot but then that, that's but that's not what he's, he wants to do it primitive yeah, style sure, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i would just think just to kind of test it to see like is right. it going to yeah. crack right away yeah like as soon as it's bone dry and goes past bone dry, is it going to start to... So one of my ideas was probably just instead of actually making a whole pot or something, uh-huh. just make discs and numbering them and then maybe trying to work with like the tempering or the grog uh-huh. and see if I can have different percentages and then play with that. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. absolutely can. Yeah, yeah. you're, you're going to have to... Mm-hmm. Test so, it and test it to see what it's going to take. What, yeah. what, it's, what it's, the stress it's going to be able to take. Yeah. Okay. It's amazing. But that there's there there is sorry finish. No. Uh, there there is um, there is somebody that has learned experience over centuries with this material. Yeah. And so I think you can keep trying yourself, or you can try mm-hmm. to seek out the humans that have used it. Yeah. And then pick their brains. Um, it's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah, I would say look up and see if there's any tribal communities that have used that clay, mm-hmm. like that area. Okay. Find them. See if there's any potters there. Just thought. I don't know. <laughs> Cause I know people that do that in Minnesota. They go and dig up clay somewhere and they figure it out. Yeah. Um, but they're usually people that are either going to school for it or they have a really good job that allows them to have time off and they go do this for fun. Yeah. Um, and I would do that if I. If I went and got a different job, I'd do like more primitive because sh- it's fascinating. Yeah, it's really cool. But I buy it from a factory 
you know, I buy milled uh, bags of minerals to make glazes yeah. out of that come from mines all over the world. Uh, and then I, I use a recipe book and I use an electric kiln. Okay. So it's mine's all very controlled. Yeah. And and so yeah, I haven't. It's not just for fun for us. Yeah, it's like it's a business. Yeah, come out. If I'm not having like over ninety percent success rate, I'm having a hard time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm having a zero percent success rate. Yeah, right. But that's but it's okay. But it's cool. It's it's a mission for you. Well, actually, this was some some, somewhat of a success, knowing that this can be fired. Right. That it, it actually doesn't dissolve in water now. So this is actually pretty good. Yeah, to make it okay, I have. Yeah. So yeah, like um, I, I know this is working to a certain they, are extent. Are they closed vessels or closed? Uh, no, like are they bottles or the cups? Or just bowls? pinch pots. Okay. Yeah, just pinch pots. Okay. Yeah. So, but but bowls or do they are they rounded or? Um, just like up, just kind of like rounded cylinder up. Cups, okay. Cylinder cups. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. I. I. I mug still, which is like, come on. Well, let's see. Oh, your company gives you mugs? Yeah, it's one of the things you get. Yeah, I would try the barrier thing. Yeah. Uh, that's what I, that would be my first yeah, guess is to just it's still nice. like, make yeah. it not be so hot. Or, like you said, you, you were saying, like, oh, put bricks in there. Well, yeah, maybe put some bricks in there mm -hmm. and then set the pots on the bricks. And yeah. Then let them then, sit like that for a while yeah. within oh, the heat it. but not touching it. Okay. And maybe even just trying to cook it like that then too maybe For, yeah like okay here and they are you. they're on like little spots in there yeah and they're really fucking close to the heat but they're not yeah. touching it okay it's yeah it's that like i talked to some guy the other yesterday that was saying oh i i don't know what happened but i put my uh i put my pot on the stove top and i go well there's your problem right there <laughs> you can't do that yeah you can't like there's only special formulas of clay that will allow that Oh really? Okay. Yeah, there's a there's a clay called Flameware that a certain company uses um, mm -hmm. here in Minnesota. I oh wow! Oh, they sell them like crazy. Yeah. I still don't want to believe it. It's weird. Flame I mean, word. well, think about it. Like the uh, the Italians and and the Romans and such, they had cooking pots that were terracotta, and they just found the right mixture formula. I don't know if they if they packed hay in it and when they fired it, the hay burned out and they created porous areas or not porous, but like. Uh, void so that that would allow the transfer of heat to be more even. I don't, I don't know, but there is there is clay that can handle it. <laughs> what is the the business called? Well, so or this is, it just... is this booth is called Yield Pottery Dude. It's mm -hmm. owned and uh, started by my one of my mentors, one of the few that I have, and he invited myself. I was the last apprentice that he had had. Um, with another couple friends that are potters as well. Mm. And so the four of us share this building. So it's, oh. the building is called Yield Pottery Dude. Uh, myself, I'm Ash Pottery, that's my sole proprietorship. Mm. They're Winchester Pottery, that's their partnership that they have, husband okay. and wife team. Okay. So it's a it's a kind of a conglomerate here. Yeah, sort of like a, uh, a collaboration sort of? Yeah, yeah, sometimes we work on pots together. Yeah. We work on pots on our own. So there is, yeah, there's a t everybody kind of has a hand in each other's work from yeah. time to time. Okay, that's really neat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like pottery is, it's traditionally a group effort. Yeah. Um, it's kind of unique that it, that we here in the States, it, we're, we're, this is my pot, you know, from start, <laughs> yeah. from start to finish. Um, I can't claim all of it because obviously I didn't go to the mine to mine the feldspar. Mm -hmm. so, so other people did that, but, but <laughs> taking the raw materials and then working in my studio and making the piece, it's mostly my own, but sometimes there are other people taking a hand in it too. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for all your help. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm gonna try and come back and and see if I can show you a success story. Then. Yeah, I would like. To see it. Yeah, that's great. Um, if you want, uh, leave your information. Uh, oh, up yeah. Front, and then take one of my cards. Yeah, sure. All, all right. right. Thank you. So this is like a, a pseudo ash glaze. There's no ash in here actually, but this is kind of the the look of an ash glaze where it starts to rivulet like that. Mm -hmm. And that's due to a, a high level of calcium carbonate. Oh, okay. And so you can get that from limestone. As well. so, so the funny thing is, I'm actually um, gathering like uh, like shells and stuff okay. um, from just eating at a buffet or just buying them, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna actually be firing the the lime or no the the, the shells mm -hmm. to create um, lime slack or whatever. Like once once it turns white, mm -hmm. uh, you can put water into it and then it becomes lime 
a slush or something, okay. and uh, you can use that to make mortar. Uh, to, to not surprised. And all of that, but, but like, you, I, so we can actually, use that for pottery too. Then, if you gr yeah, I've never used it in its raw sense, but yeah. yeah, you you can find these minerals that we have in the world in yeah. lots of different places, and so uh, wherever you find them, you just have to understand what's in it because it's not yeah. always pure. Like you get spodumene, let's say. Spodumene isn't just one thing. It's a bunch of different minerals that are put together in one rock. Yeah. So there's a certain percentage of lithium, for example, in there, like 3% lithium carbonate in spodumene. So if you're trying to source lithium somewhere, you can go to spodumene and then extract it from the spodumene. Ah, uh, okay. Um, and even, I don't think we have any here, but potters used to use, especially by the seashore, um, seashells or any, any lake that has shells. And you can put the pot on that with glaze all over it and then the shells will disintegrate and fall off mm -hmm. and they'll leave a mark of shells on the side of the pot oh. but it then won't the pots won't stick to each other yeah and so that would be used to separate whereas now we just use um like alumina and some clay so alumina hydrate and uh, like a kaolin clay mixed together and you put those on the bottoms to keep the pot from sticking you can see it there oh, like okay um the bottom of there okay so when there's flashing like you see here that's mm -hmm. some fluxing happening um, and then that can fuse to the shelf and you don't yeah. really want that to happen. See, I've done pottery before when I was young in school, mm -hmm. um, but it was all controlled. Uh, but right now my experiment is to do more primitive work. So yeah, yeah. Man, no, that's cool. <laughs> I like it. I, like I said, if, if I had a different job and could make money and then was yeah. doing pottery just yeah. for shits and giggles and, and enjoyment and experimentation, then yeah. I would, I would make pots out of clay I found and um, oh man so there's this guy what's his name Unziker Unziker I can't remember how to say it exactly but um, he went to Cambodia on a mission to re-educate the local population on how to make pottery from raw materials mm -hmm. because of like during the Khmer Rouge they came in and like killed off and displaced all kinds of people and so he's trying to rebuild the pottery culture that they had uh, and went there so he's a potter from the states and he went there yeah to help them find their feldspar and find their clay and, and how to how to throw pots and how to fire the pots and how to build kilns and all these things but not from like they're not going to continental clay company to buy their shit they have to find it themselves yeah so he he went there and did that in a totally foreign land and figured it all out and it's just um those wow. are the kind, so i would maybe try to seek out wood-fired potters because they yeah. they work closer to the earth than than electric fired potters mm -hmm. or gas because ours just comes from you know the civilized world yeah i mean if, if they're a wood-fired potter they know they understand the elements a little bit better yeah okay all right, yeah. Man, this has been definitely worth the trip. Oh, good, good. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you very much, yeah, Anthony. Pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm, I'll be back. <laughs>
Or actually, can you introduce like your first, like your name or uh, who you are? Actually, uh, Ryan Hoskins. Uh, been a professional blacksmith, welder, fabricator, foreman, stuff. I currently work for 3M because they give me insurance and vacation. Yeah, nice. So I do this as a part-time <laughs> job slash hobby. I do not work for Arms and Armor, but I work with them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I it basically this is my part-time job that basically pays for itself. Nice. So. I actually plan on um, forging like rebar. Okay. Um, do you have any suggestions as like what it might something that might be easier for a beginner? Because I have absolutely no knowledge on this. Sure. Um, um, don't use rebar. Yeah. Uh, unless you want it specifically for the aesthetic of you know, the, the, you know, the really like the look of it. Rebar. Yeah. Don't use it. It's cheap metal. It's recycled down car parts. You get alternator and you get, you know, you get engine block, you get, you know, leaf yeah. springs. And you, it's just. Because I do want to make a knife. Steel. Yeah. So, but I, I have a really cheap um, anvil and I know, like, it, it's because it's cast iron, I'm going to be working harder uh, opposed yeah. to something like and this. You will destroy the anvil yeah. over a short amount of time. Okay. Uh, where this guy's, you know, over 100 years old. Mm hmm. Um, but uh, I, I want to at least start somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, somewhere. So, like, where would you recommend that I start? Or I how? Would recommend by taking in classes, taking in workshops, learn from as many people as you can. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely not cheap. Yeah. But there's a. It's the best way. Okay. Uh, I started off at 19 years old. I traveled down to Tennessee. I spent two months in my summer taking six week long workshops from each one was for a different uh, professional blacksmith. Oh. And in the first day I improved tenfold from what I was tooling around with in, you know, in my dad's garage. Yeah. Um, I have since then I've studied the under 16 or 18 different master blacksmiths, professional blacksmiths. Wow. I have a bachelor degree in fine arts. I spent five and a half years getting in blacksmithing and jewelry and metalsmithing. Um, I really jumped in feet first. I got a hundred thousand dollar <laughs> education yeah. and sixty thousand in equipment. Oh wow! But and you know, sixteen years of experience. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the best I can uh, say is find some classes and just start. But learn from somebody else. Yeah. Because at, at the very beginning, it will be oh, that's how you use the hammer appropriately. That's how you use the different parts of the anvil. Yeah. That's how you maintain a fire. Mm -hmm. um, and get those basics out of the way rather than just fumble through it and mangle metal for yeah. you know, too long. Yeah. Uh, there's a Chicago Avenue Fire Art Center in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Uh, they do blacksmithing classes or workshops or something here and there. I'm not too involved with them. I don't know much about them, but yeah. they, they exist. There's North House Folk School in Grand Marais. They have a really nice blacksmith shop, and they do uh, a lot of classes up there. And then across the country, there's a whole bunch of uh, different various workshops mm -hmm. or places that host workshops. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's also the Minnesota Guild of Metalsmiths is our local area chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, coming up in like, end of September, I don't remember which weekend, I think the third weekend of uh, September, they're having their annual fall conference, mm -hmm. and it's in Hastings. Uh, they bring in, usually they bring in like two different professional smiths from you know, out of state, usually often, that are giving demonstrations all weekend. There's raffles, there's a, a whole bunch of stuff, and it's a wealth of knowledge at that, uh, that event and that organization. Mm -hmm. So definitely check that out as well. Okay. Uh, there's also the Minnesota School of Horseshoeing in Anoka, where I think they couple times a year do blacksmithing classes, but they fill yeah. up really fast. Okay. Because um, I, I'm really interested in like the style of this type of blacksmithing, where it's just like this. It's somewhat more primitive. It's not using like a gas like a uh, kiln or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, this is... And this I use gas forges when appropriate. 
for production work, like making a rail in, it makes absolute sense to use a gas for, gas forge. Yeah. You don't have to maintain it. You're not. When I do my knives, I use a hand crank coal to buy from this coal forge. Yeah. Because I have really, really fine control of my fire. Mm -hmm. And I have a the way that my fire pot works. It has <clears throat> very low oxidizing fire um, with the coal, so I get very little fire scale. And I've had gas forges, you just can't quite tweak right, and you get tons of fire scale. And that's the bane of a blacksmith, or a, a bladesmith specifically, it can yeah. cause a lot of issues. Um, I have a power hammer because it saves my arm. Yeah. I have you know, industrial belt sanders and drill presses and everything else just because I'm trying to make money of this. Yeah, I bet. Do you have a card or. Cool. Oh, you so you make knives? Yeah. I primarily work on uh, or do custom high end knives. Um, primarily by commission. So okay. Somebody contacts me, hey, I want this from you. Yeah. I'll make it. I don't okay. do inventory. Okay. I don't have a product line or production line. Yeah. I don't make the same knife twice. Okay. Which is nice because I'm able to do that mm -hmm. because it's not my full time gig. Yeah. So it's really hard to uh, to make it full time <laughs> and you know, be a full time artist in general. Yeah. Have you worked with um, uh, Damascus steel? Yes. Yeah. Uh, pattern welded steel. Is okay. The proper term. Oh, okay. Uh, Damascus is a town in Syria. Okay. <laughs> All right. But it's the process of layering different alloys of steel, well, yeah. forge welded them together, folded over, manipulating a pattern yeah. in the welded steel. Yeah. And then do you put it in some sort of acid that... Yeah, so you, you forge your piece out, you do all your uh, finish work, your, your heat treating, your filing, your, uh, you bring it to a near polish, and then you acid etch it, and that eats away at one of the metals. Generally, you choose your metals so that you have one that is acid resistant and one that is not. Okay. I choose, you know, a long time ago, you'd use a low carbon and a high carbon, and the high carbon doesn't etch and the low carbon does. Okay. Uh, and you get your pattern that way. But now with modern steels, I use two very, very similar alloys, except that, like, they heat treat identical. They both harden really well. But one of them has added nickel to it, so it doesn't get touched by the acid, and you get this really nice bold pattern. And you're not compromising anything in your uh, edge holding yeah. ability. Okay, that's really cool. Yeah. You know, a thousand years ago, when the Vikings did that, it would be you know iron and sheer steel or something. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you get basically a mix of both of them. After so many folds, you get carbon migration between the layers, and it all kind of evens itself out. Yeah. Today, I got modern steel to choose from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if I'm selling a six hundred dollar knife. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make the best knife that I can. I'm not gonna compromise on used steel or unknown steel. Mm -hmm. I'm paying, you know, because it costs me. The steel's the cheapest part of making a knife. Yeah. I've spent more on handle material than I have on blade material. Oh, wow. For a $600 knife. Yeah. That's crazy. See, I eventually want to make my own knife. Mm -hmm. I actually have a YouTube channel called uh, Clueless Bushcraft. Okay. And it's dedicated to just my own self-learning and discovery. Sure. Um, and I'm kind of kind of tweaking the channel now. Um, and I've been trying to interview people who know more than I do. Sure, sure. And uh, I was over there at the pottery area earlier trying to figure out how to do primitive pottery mm -hmm. and was trying to get some education from them and they, they were very helpful and you've been very helpful too. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to reach out to you again um, and uh, kind of figure something out eventually. But I, I really appreciate your uh, information. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as making a knife goes, the first thing that I would say is learn to learn basic blacksmith first yeah because they're so it's just basic modern blacksmithing and then if yeah. eventually if I wanted to do more um, if somebody comes to me and we go I really don't do lessons but I've had some people ask and like okay and the first thing that you're gonna make is a hook yeah and I mean a hook like one of these yeah because it teaches you how to forge a paper yeah it teaches you how to use different parts of the anvil so like the horn and 
it teaches you the very basic techniques. Yeah. The first thing you try to do is forge out a knife, and you don't know how to forge a paper. Well, a knife is nothing yeah. in different area, different planes. You need to learn the basics yeah. before you can advance, in my opinion. That makes sense. Um, otherwise, you're just going to be fighting yourself, and you're going to be frustrated, and you're going to go, well, why is it doing this? And it's, you, if you learn the basic techniques first, mm -hmm. then you can advance. Black, uh, bladesmithing is one of the more or most specialized segments of, or branches of blacksmithing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. There's so many different things that can go wrong, and the longer the piece gone, it gets, it exponentially becomes more difficult to keep everything straight and uniform. Mm -hmm. If you don't get your temperatures right while you're forging, you'll destroy the piece of steel without knowing it. Uh -huh. If you are using an old leaf spring you got from a junkyard because it's broken in half, <laughs> well, guess what? There's other cracks in that leaf spring that haven't shown up yet, but they will when you get 90% through with your knife and uh, it was there from before you touched a piece of metal. Yeah. That's why I only use known materials. Yeah. Have you ever worked with copper? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, quite a bit. Yeah. Would that be a good place to start too? Because uh, it's softer? A lot more expensive. It, more expensive? more expensive, but it is softer. You can cold forge it. You can hot forge it. Yeah. Um, you have to be aware of and work hardening it while you're forging it. Um, and you have to heat it back up to anneal it to soften it again. Oh. Um, as long as you have a way to heat your steel, you know, steel's cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a local steel yard, Disney Steel, you can get bar, you solid bar stock for very affordable. Don't bother uh, you know, buying you know, a three foot piece of an arts for six bucks and get a 10 to 20 foot piece of the same stuff for 18. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, or half the price easy. Yeah. And they have a lot more. I like a money. junkyard, you said? No, discount steel. Discount steel? If it's an okay. industrial steel yard, but they okay. have a storefront open to the public. Okay. Um, you can go and get, you know, they have all these racks of flat bar and what, you know, a whole bunch of different dimensions of flat bar, then angle iron, and then round stock. And mm. okay. Just start with a mild steel. Yeah. Don't waste yourself on your money on uh, tool steel or high carbon steel until you have a better idea what you're doing. Okay. Um, yeah, that's been great information. <laughs> and uh, you beware that there's a lot of good stuff on YouTube, but there's also a lot of crap on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm trying to pick out like, um, like, what's the word? Um, just advisors, I suppose, or mentors, yep. people who would be able to kind of mentor me and figure things out. But I'm trying to work things one step at a time. But yeah, this is the first step, just yep. talking to someone. Yeah. Well, it's a fun <laughs> journey. It can be frustrating and expensive, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a blast. Okay. Um, not necessarily for the pain of heart. I've seen a lot of people get frustrated and fail and you know, give mm -hmm. up because they thought it was going to be easy. easy. <laughs> you know, I want to learn how to make a knife and then you know, <clears throat> just get flustered and frustrated because they don't know what they're doing. And then, yeah. like, well, you know, start from square one, not, you know, 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a year before I made my first knife. Oh, really? It was five years before I made my first sword. Wow. That's crazy. And, you know, you can stock removal and, you know, grind a knife out of anything without any forging. Mm -hmm. You can still make a good product. Yeah. Um, but with the actual forging, it gets more difficult. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> go wash myself up. <laughs> All right. All right, so that's it for today's video. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the interviews. Um, I'll talk more about the interviews um, in a different video. Um, I also want to mention one more thing. Um, I actually did spend some time uh, working on my pottery after that other video that I posted um, when all of my pots exploded. That's not the only time my pots exploded because I've tried it 
uh, two other times and I made just really basic pinch pots, dried them out and then uh, um, tried to fire them and uh, I basically just push the fire closer and closer to the pots and the moment it touches the pot um, it, it ends up starting to like crack and, and, and pop and just blow up basically. Um, yeah, and I haven't really spent time making those discs and uh, because, I don't know, for some reason a small part of me just wanted a pot to work. Um, but I really have to play around with those discs and making mixtures and then try to see what I can actually uh, get fired. Um, but yeah, I'll start on uh, my blacksmithing stuff later on. I actually have an anvil right here. It's a pretty cheap, um, what was it, a Harbor Freight uh, anvil uh, made of carbon steel, so it's not the best, but it's a start somewhere. Alright, well, thanks again for watching you guys. Take care. See you guys in the next video.